Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are with Jimmy Arias, former top five player in the world, disciple of Nick Boletari, another one of my favorites because he comes from a cold weather state where people say you can't make it from the snow, but you got the Jensen brother, James Blake, Jimmy Arias, you there, uh, the McEnroe, people who made it through the snow, it maybe eventually ended up in Florida, but they got their start there with Jimmy. Thank you for coming to the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I'm sure you got that a lot, right? In terms of how did you make it out of Buffalo, New York, to top five in the world? I mean, look, I got a lot of stuff when I was young because I had another thing that I was little. So not only was I from Buffalo, but I'm small. So I heard very often how it's impossible for me to make it at my height and where I'm coming from and all those other things. Um, so I always took that sort of as uh, motivation to show people that you can make it. Obviously I left home, I left Buffalo at 13. Um, I won the Buffalo Men's City Open when I was 12. So <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to move on and get some someplace where there was maybe a little bit more competition. Having said that, my group of kids, when I grew up in Buffalo, there were some very good players. One was named Bobby Bank. He got to 200 ATP okay. in the world. There was a guy named Seth Bowen who got the top 100 in doubles on the ATP. Um, and a couple of guys that played, one played three for Clemson. Another one played six for Ohio State. So I had a group that was maybe the best group ever out of Buffalo, I would say. Yeah. Um, you know, it's dried up since. <laughs> but I say when you when you are in a sort of a small town, right? Uh, big fish in a small pond. For a tennis player, it's not always a terrible thing because you do get the most attention. You get like breaks on court time. You get invited to the top groups. You get to play with the grown men versus kind of being in Florida. Too many options can kind of confuse you, make you a little bit all over the place. And two coaches actually make you dispensable. Where if you're in Buffalo, every coach wants to get their hands on Jimmy and be invested, right? Yeah, and like I mean, sort of take an interest. And so that that kind of can work to your benefit. Are you kidding? You actually just described exactly how I grew up. First of all, every indoor tennis club in Buffalo allowed me to play for free. Right. <laughs> um, every coach, as you said, was trying to help me and wanted to help me. There's no question about that either. All the men, the best men players in Buffalo, starting when I was eight, already let me play in their group and play with them. Um, so yes, I always felt this, you know, obligation almost to Buffalo tennis community because of the way they took care of me as a kid. And they're actually the ones that took me to Florida. They recognized at 13, you need to leave. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened sort of the way I, I ended up with, with Nick Volatari was the Colony Beach. And he was a head tennis director at the Colony Beach and Tennis Resort. And the only reason I went to the Colony is because the owner of the Colony was from Buffalo. Ah. This group of men took me on their tennis vacation to the Colony with them. And that's where I met Nick. And that's, you know, how that whole thing started. We'll probably get into that more later. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so how did that go? Because... You know, Nick was very instrumental in trying to help me get my academy started in Chicago. Because again, cold weather city, you know, look, there's no tennis market here, even though we had like Adam Schwartz and Katrina Adams and Donald Young and uh, John Vergozin. We had a lot of tennis sort of people, uh, prominence in the city, but people were like, yeah, tennis academy on Chicago South Side in the cold. So I had to actually fly Nick in and wow. took him on like this tour to go see the mayor and the president of the University of Chicago. And everybody was like, Nick can say, Nick. And I remember Nick telling the mayor at the time who was wrong. It was like, Mayor Emanuel, this can work. In fact, I'm about to sell my academy to your brother, Ari, for a couple billion. So I know it can work. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? It was like perfect timing, right? So how did how did the conversation with Nick go? Because he comes in with his, his salesmanship and makes you feel like you're the best in the world. Well. That, the interesting thing, I'm, I'm sort of different than anyone else that met and knew Nick Volatari, because as I told you, when I went to see him, 
I didn't go to see him. I went to the Colony Beach on a tennis vacation with my friends from Buffalo, with my mm. grown-up man from Buffalo. I didn't know who Nick Volatieri was. No one knew who Nick Volatieri was at that point. Right. The way the Colony worked is you would go up to the front desk and tell the guy, his name was Julio Moros, tell Julio that you wanted to play a match, and he'd set you up with somebody of similar level to you. So I waited in that line. And when I got to the desk, I said, my friends from Buffalo said, look, this kid's really good. Can you give him somebody good to play with? And he set me up with Mike DePalmer, who was three years older than me and was ranked four in the nation in the 16 and unders, who happened to be a local Sarasota Bradenton kid. Right. Um, so they send us on court one. Mike and I are playing. We've warmed up, we're playing a couple games, and all of a sudden this dude with a deep tan and a mustache that look kind of comes running on the court, kicks Mike off, and brings out a basket and has a guy standing behind in the basket putting balls in his hand as he's feeding to me. I've never seen that before. He wasn't even Nick wouldn't even reach into the basket to get the balls. He just had some guy putting balls in his hand as he's feeding. And all he's saying to me, you have to realize that my game was sort of unique at that time, the way I hit my ground strokes. And I might go back a little bit to tell you why, because I want to give my dad a little bit of credit. So mm -hmm. my dad was an electrical engineer, didn't know anything about tennis. I took a lesson when I was seven years old at a club in Buffalo. The guy told me, shake hands with the racket, which is kind of an Eastern grip. Right. Stand sideways, take the racket back hit and point the follow through at your target. Right. So my dad knows, knows nothing about tennis, but when I come off the court and he's from Cuba, so he had an accent, my dad. So when I come off the court, I, I said, what do you think, dad? And he goes, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. <laughs> and what do you mean? He goes, how can you swing full speed and stop? That means you're slowing down when you're hitting. He goes, I will teach you for him. He doesn't know, he didn't know anything about tennis. So he thinks about it for a while and he says, all right, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take the racket back with your left hand. Your right hand is just going along for the right. So that like makes you turn when uh -huh. you take it back with your left. Yep. He said, I want the racket head pointed up because I want it in motion. That'll be faster than the way you're just taking it straight back, stopping and restarting the swing. So I want it in motion. And then I want you to just relax your arm and let it go. Wherever the finish finishes, that's but just it's connected to your body. And he said, someday you'll learn to control it. But I want you to swing with a loose arm as hard as you can. And someday you'll learn to control it. So that is the reason why I won the men's Buffalo men's city open at 12. I was hitting the ball harder than mm. men because I was taking a full cut and they were doing the old style of sort of bunting the ball around. Mm. Um, so when people saw me play, all those years, I'm eight, nine, 10, they'd always say things like, you can't swing that hard under pressure. Your arm's gonna fall off. They gave me all the reasons why I was wrong. Right. That was the one thing that Nick did differently. All Nick did when the guy's handing him balls and he's feeding me, he just kept saying, great, that a good boy, great, great, fantastic. And he actually, I actually heard him, and this was not good for Nick, if you knew me, if you know me sort of, once I saw this part, I kind of lost a little bit of, I don't know, respect or faith or something in Nick and that I hear him turn to the guy handing him balls and I hear him whisper, what should I tell him he's doing wrong? <laughs> and, and so I'm, in my head, I'm like, who is, the, what, what is, bring back the Palmer. I want to play. Right, right. Um, you know, but what ended up happening is I stayed there for a week and as I stayed there, Nick started explaining to me, we've got two or three good players. Mike the Palmer was one of them. Um, and I've got a school that lets you out at noon. And in those days, there was no such thing as that. There was no homeschooling. There was right. there online. Was, there was online. There was none of that stuff. So you're going to school till four o'clock, wherever you are. This was obviously a huge advantage to get out of school at noon and right. be in Florida where I could play outside the rest of the day. Um, so I went home and basically told my dad, I'm, I'm moving to Florida. And then that summer I went to Kalamazoo, even though I was 13, I went and played the 16 and unders and I talked to the bunch of the kids and Nick had the sort of vision to realize I'm not going to charge any of these top juniors to come. Mm -hmm. So I got probably 10 of the top 20 kids in the nation to come to the, to the Knicks 
And basically we stayed at different coaches' houses in the beginning. I lived in Nick's house. In the end, it was me and nine girls. Nick had all the girls in the academy and I, I was there the year before. So I, you know, whatever. Got lucky. You got yeah. lucky, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so um, and then the other coaches had four or five kids each. Um, mm. And that's sort of how it started. And then eventually he bought a motel and then, a guy named Lewis Marks gave him two and a half million to buy the the property that the academy now is is sitting on, and and the rest is history. And it became Nick. And the other thing about Nick that sort of always amazed me, this all started when Nick was forty eight or forty nine years old. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't Nick Volatari until fifty, 50 to fifty right. to eighty or whatever it was that those years is when he really became Nick Volatari. And that I don't know that gives hope to people like me that are now. <laughs> <laughs> almost almost 60 and you're thinking you know you're on the other side of the mountain nick was still climbing at that stage yeah he, he was the pe teacher before that exactly you know exactly. it was then he became this personality and reinvented itself exactly uh so you you go there you ascend you become top five in the world right and now we are you know french open time uh you're in the era of yannick noah Right. Well, now this is like the anniversary of Yannick Noah right now. So so give me a good Yannick story, because I'm in Chicago. Joe Kim Noah is a famous Chicago bill, a Chicago bull. Yannick came to town a couple of times. Uh, I met him at a Fed Cup in Marseille. Um, but one of the most interesting people I've ever met. I mean, look, I've got. Two or three stories, one of them I probably shouldn't tell, because, <laughs> you know, the first one is my favorite match of my whole career, without a doubt, is I played Yannick the year he won the French at the U.S. Open in the quarters night match. Um, and I've never wanted a match so badly. I went into that into that U.S. Open with sort of a strange attitude now that I look back on it. The attitude was, if I don't make at least the semifinals, I'd won four tournaments kind of coming into the U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. I remember saying to myself, if I don't make at least the semifinals, this whole summer has been wasted. Mm -hmm. um, so I had it's put so much pressure on myself mm -hmm. to do well at that U.S. Open. And I'm playing Yannick night match quarters, great atmosphere. The funny thing about sort of New York and the U.S. Open is I'm the American. He's a French player. But I would <laughs> say the crowd was 50-50 probably because right. he was that, you know, flashy and fun to watch. He had hit it the first tweener that anyone had ever seen the round before when he beat Aaron Krikstein. Um, no one had ever hit a tweener yet. Um, so, you know, and he won the French Open. So the crowd, was, it was it was an electric sort of feeling. I wanted it so badly. I've never acted like that. Every point I won, I was freaking out. And, right, right. <laughs> um, and I still, I'll never forget the end of the match because I was up two sets to one, but he won the fourth set, six, one in the fifth set. He was kind of dominating, but I kept finding a way to hold serve. But it was every every service hold was tough and he was holding pretty comfortably. Mm. And it's gotten all the way to five, six in the fifth. He's serving five, six in the fifth and 1530. It's the first time he's had any pressure at all on his serve. He misses a first serve, goes for an ace, second serve and double faults. So it makes it double match point for me, 1540. He misses the first serve at 1540. So in my head, I'm aware enough to know he's not going to go for an ace right. for the forehand <laughs> again. He's right. going to kick this one in. Right. I'm going to have a forehand, 100%. I'm going to run around and I'm going to get a forehand. And I decide I'm going to hit as hard as I can right down the middle because I knew I was, I was literally crapping my pants. I couldn't swallow. I remember trying to swallow right before and I couldn't. Um, <laughs> So I was aware enough of all those things. So I get the exact serve I want, the kick serve to my backhand. I run around. I'm so anxious that I hit it so far out in front and it goes for an angle winner. It looked like I was the most clutch, you know, <laughs> ice in my veins guy in the world, but I missed my shot by like 10 feet. <laughs> um, so that's sort of a match I'll never forget. It was a favorite match I ever played in my life. He was incredibly gracious, gave me a hug after afterwards. Um, and the other... The other tennis story that I remember from Yannick again playing against him was we played once in Stockholm, Sweden, and I'd never seen this athletic of a move from a tennis player. I had match point, 
tie break in the third set. So when we played, it seemed to be, we both held serve for the most part against each other. Um, tie break in the third set, match point for me, maybe seven, six in the tie break, something along those lines. He comes in on my forehand. I hit a great forehand pass cross court. I don't think there's any way he's going to get to it, but he does full dive and cuts off the angle on the dive. You have to kind of semi-dive forward to cut off the angle. Right. right. He makes a drop volley, but I come running up and he's laying on the ground literally right in front of me. I can see him laying on the ground and I choke a little bit. So instead of just like hitting it, <laughs> I hit a lob. And somehow from the ground, he gets on his feet and goes straight up. And I'm looking like his feet are here <laughs> at my face. It was the freakiest thing. And I'm going, ah! Yeah. And he's able to get his racket on it and hit it for a winner. Crowd starts stomping their feet. I lose the next two points in 15 seconds. <laughs> because it's just, that was, it was just too good. That, that, that was, um... The story that I shouldn't tell, but... I guess it's it's, a, I don't what's know. the podcast? What the hell? Okay. I we played it. There was an exhibition in um I don't know what wherever the Lakers were playing back in the 80s. Forum. Okay, so we played in the forum. And it was McEnroe Noah played one singles match. I played Vince Van Patten in the other mm -hmm. singles match, and now and now we're playing a doubles to, to end the exhibition, a doubles match. And it's <laughs> me and Yannick against McEnroe and Van Patten. During the one of the points in the doubles, McEnroe's shoe breaks. He literally like runs out of his shoe. So okay. he's going into his bag to get another shoe and someone in the crowd starts yelling, you know, throw me your shoe. He throws a shoe. He starts then asking for other stuff. He's throwing stuff into the crowd. I get you know, a little annoyed at the, the weight. So I take off my shirt and <laughs> throw it into the crowd. And then all of a sudden, Yannick starts slowly taking his shorts down. <laughs> <laughs> and he's only in a jock. Oh, my goodness. Takes his shirt, shorts <laughs> off, throws it in the crowd. 500 people come running onto the court. Most of them females come running onto the court. <laughs> We run off the court and the exhibition <laughs> ended. We never finished. <laughs> As before Tennis Channel. Oh. That was before internet, luckily. This was before well. internet. Oh, before oh, tennis oh yeah. my God. Classic yeah. young. Classic was, young. Classic. Yeah, went, and I actually remember saying to Vince, all right, Vince, top that. You know, because we're right. we each, we each taking it one step further, Vince. No, no, no. Game over. He, he wouldn't go there. It, game over. So you, you talk about another showman. Monfils is probably will go down as my favorite player and the, the most exciting player to not win a slam. And I always remember the time we had match points against Fed at the French Open. I'm like, damn, if he would have got that one, his whole career would have been different. But we saw him now, right? And I say, besides a Serena night match at the US Open, a French player land on Chartrier at night is the most violent experience that I've ever been, I've ever been in. And the state. So we watched, we watched Monfils last night play a match in the fifth, down for love, cramping, injured, looked like he was going to throw in a towel, but then he like finds life, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think it's going to be a disappointment that he, you know, he doesn't get a slam. I, it's argued to say he's probably not going to get a slam before he retires. But he, to me, is like Yannick Noah-esque in terms of entertainment factor, ability, but just didn't quite get there. Yeah, he actually uh, somewhat disappoints me, I, I would say, because I do think he should have been winning slams. He's the most athletic player the game has ever seen as yeah. far as movement. And he has massive power if he wants to use it. Mm -hmm. But it's always seemed to me that he's almost more about the show than winning in some way. So he, it, it, and I don't know this, I just watch him play sometimes and it looks like he says, let's see if you can hit a winner off this ball. Let's see if you can hit a winner off this ball. And he feeds you sitters and then makes ridiculous gets. Yes. And it makes the game in a threat of five set tournament also a little too physical in some ways for him. So even if he does get through a few matches, sometimes 
I think he's taken a lot out of him in the early rounds when he probably could have gone through matches pretty quickly if he would just use his power mm -hmm. that he has. Um, that's the one part of the game that sort of always, I felt like saying, come on, just play to win one, one or two of these rather than for the show. It always right, felt right. like there's a tiny bit of him that's, that hopes the crowd enjoys it, which I appreciate. That's great that there's a player like that. We need that in tennis. But I do think ability-wise, there should be some majors in, in his quiver. And, I, you know, I, I think he's fine. He's happy. He's had a great career anyway. It's all good. But, but I would be disappointed with myself, I think, if I had that sort of natural ability. Um, and had managed to get a couple of slams. And in, in, in his defense, it did happen to be at a time when you had these the greatest of all time guys playing. So that that didn't help matter, certainly, for him. Um, I mean, he would have made so much money. He'd yeah. be a French player, an African-American French player, beating Roger Federer at the French Open. I mean, literally, the amount of money he would have made off the court I mean, been. I'm sure he's. I'm sure he's not starving anytime. Oh, he's definitely not starving. So, definitely so not life is probably fine for him in the in the end. Um, and the other thing about him that I'll never forget, and I wish I remember the name of the sport, but he was number one in the world in another sport. He only played yes. at the uh, Tennis Channel Open in Las Vegas, or where they played. Um, he was young. He was probably 19 years old or so, and he played in the tennis. And at that event, they also had this paddle. It wasn't padel that they play now, but it was a ball. It was a sport that had a punctured tennis ball and a paddle. Mm -hmm. And you played kind of in the service line. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly a California sport, I think, for the most part. But the guy that won 15 U.S. Opens and was incredibly cocky was entered in the tournament because they had a prize money tournament coinciding with the tennis. And Monfils, because he lost in the tennis, said, oh, I'll try this sport. Plays the sport. They let him in the, you know, give him a wild card. In the, he's never played the sport before. He wins his first round. And then he plays this U.S. Open 15, the Federer, they were calling him of that sport. Mm -hmm. And Monfils beats him and ends up winning the tournament. So to me, he was number one in the world in another sport the first time he played. Just to give you an idea of how talented the guy is. Yeah. I think the only person that sort of trumps his talent could be Nick Kyrgios. From a movement standpoint. Yeah. Ability, and I saw like last year when I saw or I saw him like Nick really try to get that one. Like that was yeah. one where you like where you had that kind of Monfils moment where it was like, let me just try to get this one. Right. And yes. I saw that. You're right. Was, Kyrgios is another guy. Kyrgios worse than Monfils for me on how disappointed myself I would be. Yeah. That talent deserves a slam. Or at least top 10 in the world. I mean, yeah. I think he's getting there. Something, something about, I feel like something about the Wimbledon tournament last year made him feel like I just he need to. Been, I wonder if he would have been top 10 if you added those points that he would have gotten for Wimbledon because they had no points last year at Wimbledon, no which points. is kind of a travesty. Right. That was um, Because he think did he have a been. great year. I think he would have been. He might have been, actually. That's, you know, that's he, he might have been. So we look at the French Open, right, and we see almost an end of an era, right? We see um, sort of the new players ushering out some of the the, the older ones, right? Uh, and I hate to say old, but you know, you see Rafa not there, Roger not there. You see Holger who was coming on quickly. Um, who's your pick for the US Open? I, I have my eyes on sort of two matches in particular, which I think can have a, an impact on the quarters. And that's Monfils and Holger, which yeah. I think Monfils could win, right? If he like hydrates and doesn't cramp up, right? Like he did last. Well, that's night. to me that's an important thing. You got to remember that uh, Monfils is not is not young, and he hasn't played many matches. And yes. at that age, when you've already cramped once, and you got three out of five sets coming against a young gun, it's a lot to ask. Yeah, but it might be just the moment for Monfils to sort of shine. So you're right. I think he he's. It'll be, that'll be a fun match to watch, yeah. no question about it. And Holger's the kind of guy that uh, he's got some attitude. It, it could a lot yeah, of the players, yeah, a lot of players have trouble with him for whatever reason, and he sometimes has that feeling of 
oh, I'm injured, I'm injured, I'm injured, and then he finds a way to win. I've seen him do that a number of times already. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. That's a mad, that's a must see sort of. Yeah, match. and I think I think Monfils, the crowd got Monfils over the hump last night. I think Holger will feed off of the crowd's negative energy towards him. So he's somebody where I think the crowd getting very sort of violent on, you know, excited about Monfils could actually inspire Holger even more. Yeah, so, no, I used to love the crowd against me, to be honest. I liked it better if it was if it was nasty enough, because then yeah. I had the feeling like I want to make you angry by winning this point. Mm -hmm. And I'll do anything to win this point just so you're pissed off the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually liked it also in a weird way. Yeah. So I can understand. You're probably right about Holger. I bet you he, he's not going to hate it. He's not going to. The hate only it. thing that the crowd against you does is if it starts going against you, if the match starts, the momentum starts going against you, it can make it more difficult to turn it back because you feel it when the crowd's sort yeah. of there and the other guy's got some swagger going. Then yeah. it then it does cause you some issues. And I think. From having been in the final or coaching the final in both states, I think the U.S. Open gets loud, but it doesn't feel, you don't feel the people. Hmm. I think Chartrier, you feel the people on that you. Could be. That you know could what be. I mean? Because it's big, yeah. but it's not massive. And you actually feel them, like, close to you. And you're like, like I feel them. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's, it's I mean, yes and no. I do remember a couple times in the Noah matches in particular where the crowd – got so loud after a great shot that I actually got like a chill. <laughs> um, it, it was weird. It was actually, I, you know, I got the chills when, when they scream because you're not ready for it. It's a great point, but then wow, it's so yeah. in the, at the open. So I don't the know. The match I think could have a big impact on the quarters and the semis is PFO's Vera. If you look at their next two matches, right? They both have very what should and could be very routine matches. And then they play each other in the next round. And I think it's a huge opportunity for Francis and, or for both of them, quite honestly. And I think that those two matches have a big impact on this entire tournament. What do you think about this Verov and potential TFO match? Yeah, I mean, obviously they got to get there, but, but uh, and TFO's got Karatsev, in the next round who has made a semi of a major and hasn't played as recently, but still to me, that's, it's a tougher match than uh, Zverev. So I expect Zverev probably to be in the third round. Um, it's an opportunity for Francis, to be honest, because Zverev's still not quite Zverev. Mm -hmm. And on clay a year ago, you would have given a heavy, you know, favorite to Zverev at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. Francis made that run to the semis of the U.S. Open. I think I think Francis is also turning into one of those better in the big moments and sometimes can, I don't want to say lose interest. I'm not exactly sure, but he'll play some indifferent matches. Yes. But if he's fully engaged, he's unbelievably good. Uh, he's top couple players in the world. And you would assume at every major, he's going to be fully engaged. So he's going to be a guy you don't want to face in the major. So certainly there's an opportunity. He hasn't had a great clay court season, Francis, right. but there's an opportunity for him to, to make another long run. Um, I'd love to see him get more consistent, but he's another guy that, that seems to enjoy himself. And that's an important part. Tennis is brutal, the sport. Most of tennis players go nuts at some point. They can't handle the day in, mm -hmm. day out pressure. You finish... Even like, like for me, I, my first big tournament win was in Rome. I, and I remember having this thought of, yay, great. I won Rome. I got to go tomorrow and get ready for the French and the next tournament. And it, I don't know, at some point it got to me a little bit of, this is just, I'm a, you know, a mouse on a wheel here, running and running and running, and you got mm -hmm. the pressure comes back again the next year, and what have you done for me lately, and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And Francis seems to just enjoy what he's doing, and there's some days when he's not as interested. I think during a major, he'll be interested, so mm -hmm. he'll always be dangerous. So what do you think about the women? I think that when you think about the top three women, um, or right now that are sort of playing the most consistent, uh, you got Sabalenka, Rabakina, 
Fiontek. Um, of the three, Fiontek is probably the best of them on clay. For sure. Um, and there's everybody else. Who's your dark horse on the women's side um, to sort of join those top three? Well, I can't really call this one a dark horse, but I have to mention that, that um, there's Jesse Pagula, who is ranked. She's she's ranked three. Yes. Um, and she's from Buffalo. And I actually helped her. You know, I coached her. Not I, I, I was hired for 50 days as a consultant coach about three or four years ago. Mm. Um, and actually... I shouldn't tell this story probably either because I don't normally tell this story, but there's a 0% chance she would be where she was if it wasn't for me, not because <laughs> of my tennis. Hang on. I'm going to tell you the story is not because of my tennis coaching necessarily. Um, but I have to go back to my daughter to tell the story properly because my daughter mm -hmm. had a part in this. My, I made my kids pick a sport and try to be good at it. I didn't care which sport. My daughter picked basketball. Excellent choice for a four foot. Anyway. <laughs> um, so she's playing it. The only thing I ask is that you give me a hundred percent effort when you play. I want, I want to, that's the most important thing for character building reasons. She plays a tournament in Orlando. I didn't think she tried her hardest. So that's a two hour drive from Orlando back to my house. That's two hours of hell for me um, <laughs> on that drive home. So at some point in the drive, while I'm yelling at her, she yells back at me, I was trying to try. And I, of course, said, what the hell is trying to try? Either you try or you don't try. What does that mean? <laughs> and she said, I wasn't, I had no energy. That was all the energy I had. So that was all I could get. And I said, okay, something's wrong with you. I'm going to go get you tested because I'm not buying the thing. Right. I go get her blood tested and she had a thyroid condition, my daughter. So she actually was trying to try. Mm -hmm. She didn't have the energy. So now fast forward to when I'm working with Pagula. I'm trying to get her to move her feet. She was always a little bit flat footed and slow and not really moving her feet. And so I was doing a drill where I said, I need your shoes to make a sound. I want to hear them squeaking. I'm at the net. I'm volleying not far from her, but I want that quick little steps and the ball's coming back to her fast. Um, her dad's watching. And he says from the sideline, if you could make her shoes make a sound, you'd be the first guy ever. Um, <laughs> so he's giving, he's giving her a hard time from the sideline, okay? Mm. So I've been hired for 50 days. I've given her 10 maybe days at this point. And she can tell I'm getting annoyed that it's true. Her shoes never make a sound. I can't make them. Like, no matter how much I'm giving her, I'm not getting it back. Right. And she says to me, I'm trying to try. And I go... Ooh, I've heard what? that before. <laughs> I went and got her. I'm not going to go into it, but I got her tested. There were some things. They got them cleaned up. And the rest she, of history. she took off from there. And now the annoying part for me is I am no longer the best player ever out of Buffalo. She's past me. She's right, right. She's past <laughs> so, so that hurts a little. But, you know, in the end, I'm, ha I'm happy for her. So we've seen her. She is, I mean, I would... Obviously, at three in the world, you're not a dark horse, right? Um, but we've seen her get to some semis, right? Yeah. And you, you feel like... She can't seemingly be... One weapon away. She's probably yeah. one weapon away, right? So I like, haven't been on a court with her. What do you think she could add to sort of get over that hump? Because that's a hell of a hump. I mean, you know, I think, like I always tell people, when you... Quarters to the finals of a slam is like a whole different turn, yeah. right? Semis is like, you know, you're close, but you're really far. You're you know, so it's, yeah, you it's, are. It's, it's, you're far, right? And so what do you think, like maybe if there was one- I mean, obviously it's her serve. To me, it's her serve. Um, yeah. It's very few free points, somewhat attackable second serve. It's not horrible, obviously. She's three yeah. in the world. Just but kick the, the best women players, generally the ones that can win, I mean, Spontek, maybe not because of her serve. She just moves better than everybody else. Um, it's probably the reason for her. Um, but Sabalenka, Rabakina, the ones you mentioned, they're serving big and returning big. And that's usually what wins on the women's game. Mm -hmm. Pagula doesn't have, she returns pretty well. She doesn't have the serve and she moves as well as she can, but she's not 
she's not athletically fast. Mm -hmm. um, those are the two things that sort of one of those have to become exceptional for her to go on. But what she does have also is mental, incredibly strong mental. She doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't get flummoxed in any way. She's calm at all times. And that's, that's a big, big reason why she's ranked as high as she is. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got we got Pagula. You're staying loyal to your Buffalo roots. Uh, what, what I mean, look on the women's side, it's sort of anybody can win. It's, anybody. Just it's crazy. It's Coco. Any, anybody from anywhere. Um, I don't know what you think with Coco Golf lately. I've seen her forehand. It seems to be getting worse a little bit to me. I wish she'd come see me. I'd help her forehand because I I know what's wrong with it. But um, you know. I think that she's got to get out of her head now. It's in her head because everybody talks about it. So she, anytime she watches a match of hers or anything, someone's going to say something about second serve and, and forehand. Second yeah, serve has, has gotten better to me. Gotten better. Yeah. Um, and her first serve gotten better. better. She's got this yeah. Vera thing with the serve now, where it's like Vera, the second serve was in his head, right? The double. Yeah. And he'd yeah. like miss them bad, shank them. So that's in her head. I think that. The game, I mean, I think like we're looking about number one, the game is getting more athletic, right? The younger generation is coming. And I think for the first couple years of her career, her athleticism was her biggest advantage. But it's still there. She's still faster than everybody. I She's think. still faster than everybody. But I don't think she has the, the strokes to exploit the lack of speed for the other player. The forehand's yeah, not probably, big enough. Yeah, that's right? probably true. The backhand is great, but it's not big enough. Yeah, the yeah. is big enough. So yeah. she's fast, but she's not able to expose. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, you know, now that I, you know, I know this is your show, but Sloan is. She could win. Only, what, what's going on? Like, oh, is she going to win another major just out of nowhere? For the I mean, you know what? She, on clay, she's just like, I mean, it's just at home. It's like she like pulled her pillow and mattress out and just slept on it. Um, you know, she's very capable of doing it. I think she likes Paris. She likes the environment. You know, I think that the site is not as big and as crazy, you know, because some site, it's all about mentally what makes people feel comfortable. And I think some big sites can kind of be a little bit overwhelming where Paris is a little bit easier to manage than like, let's say New York or something. Yeah, it, like is. That. So it is. She likes it. Um, and I mean, it slows the game enough down where you have a player who might be a little bit slow footed. I mean, fast and slow footed is different, right? Yeah. So like, like the game to be, I would say Sloan doesn't like a race, she likes a fight. And I mm. think the clay court season creates physical fights for her where her big skill sets can, you know, sort of shine. And, you know, she's like, like, she knows how to play on clay, right? And so I think that this is a good time. She looked awfully good the first two matches. Solid. And, and I think she's also one of the people that draws confidence from any wins versus they got to be like a good win. So she won the 125, right? Where someone can say, okay, so what? Big deal. Well, she's the kind of person that any wins gives her confidence. I'm right. a believer in that, by the way. When you were talking earlier about me being from Buffalo and all that sort of stuff, the one thing that it helped me with was I always won. I won so many tournaments growing up, obviously. Yes. That when I walked on a court in that early part of my career, I felt like the end result is I win. Um, so that made me not panic with the ebbs and flows that inevitably happened during a match because I knew that the end result is already written in stone. I win. I win. I'm just, and I would even say to myself sometimes in a tough po point, like, man, this is going to be interesting. To, am I going to hit a let cord winner? Or like I expected to win even good luck because I win. Um, it was weird and it was great. And it's unfortunate that I lost it fairly soon. Um, right. I but I think that's that's what's wrong with tennis now. I think that too many people they they play up an age group or they want to play against higher UTRs or they duck matches, right? And they never learn how to winning teaches you how to win. Like having a good loss and having losing good matches can also become a skill, right? If you want to yeah. play up and just have some good losses, 
that also is a skill the more you have that happen to you. So I love to have people like, hey, win a tournament. Like you haven't yeah. won a tournament, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that too many of these young kids, Americans in particular, this, how many, you might be top 15 in the country. When's the last tournament you won? Yeah, no, no, I, look, I'm now, I've gone full circle in my life. Somehow I ended up Nick Volatari in a sense. I'm running the place he started, the IMG Academy. Right. I'm director of tennis. I have this fight with parents every day because everybody thinks my kid needs to practice with players better than him because they need to get used to that ball. And, and they're also afraid of their UTR dropping. And there's all these outside things that they're thinking UTR is killing the kid in some ways. Cause it's, you're, you're not, your level's here. I don't care if you're four, five, six, seven, you want to get here. You got to do whatever it takes to get here. You don't need to just lose all the time to a, if you're a four to a six every day, cause it's not going to hurt your UTR. It's not going to do you any good. Yeah. What you're saying is exactly right. And I try to get the parents to say winning is a habit. So is losing. You yeah. get happy. You're happy to lose to someone higher than you. Cause it doesn't hurt your ego or your UTR, but you're not, you're not learning anything and you're not putting anything on the line. So you know, it's, it's become difficult with this UTR thing in the business we're both in. I mean, you know, yeah. teaching kids to play. You got You got to, you want to become a great player. You're not a great player now. Do everything you can to become a great player later. That's what yeah. it's And, and eventually, off. you know, I think that eventually your job in tennis becomes to win. When you go to, if you get, if you happen to play on a college team and get lucky enough to do that, your job is to get me a point. Yeah. I need you to win. Yeah. Like, I don't care how it happens. I need you to win. And on tour, your job is to win. And your job mm -hmm. as a coach is, yes, we need to improve our foot speed. We need to improve our effort. We need to improve our serve. We need to improve our second serve. But this week, my job is to try to help you win. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? While, and how do you win while improving? And I think that is where the pro game and the college game is not connected to the junior. Mm -hmm. Right? Because yeah. I always say there's some survival instincts that are in anybody. Right? You get down on the ground, you will find a way to get up. And it's like, I don't need you to like play somebody who's two points ahead of you so you can learn survival instincts. That's just there. Like you learn how to fight naturally. Yeah. You need to learn how to finish. You need to learn how to win. And until we start to groom our kids to do that, it'll continue to be a large gap between the number of Americans, which I think we're doing good now, number of Americans who are top 100 in the world with all the mm -hmm. resources we have in this country, yeah. And the number of kids who are playing tennis at the bottom. I just like, and I always say, like, my job, we can lose first round in Strasbourg. My job in 2018, oh, first round in Nuremberg to um I can I forgot the look. Putin Saver. Yeah. Right? Putin Saver. My job this week is or the next two weeks is to help you win. Period. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we gotta like take that approach. So I think Sloan is capable of winning this event with the right set of matches, the right momentum, the confidence she got from a 125, no matter what level of tournament it was, semis last week in Rabat, that's enough matches for her to start to get rolling. You know what it I mean? Looks like, it, it looks similar, eerily similar to when she was winning a couple majors, kind of feeling out of nowhere, but you know yes. what I mean? She, and yeah. she, the way she's looked the first two rounds, I guess that's my dark horse. You asked me for a dark horse, she's not ranked high, I'm going with Sloan. There it is, there it is. Um, that's a good one. I would take that one as well. Yeah. Uh, so on the men's side, who are you picking? Then I know you've been so generous with your time. We got to let you go. The obvious, I mean, you got Ivy, you got Alcaraz, you got Djokovic, uh, Medvedev has gone. You know, who, who are you picking and who's your dark horse? Well, so it was interesting how you pre prefaced one of the things you said, because it was, um, the young guys pushing out sort of the older guys. And that was one of the things that was bothering me about what's happened on the tour because of COVID and because there was this sort of gap. And it felt like Federer just, COVID happened, he was already older and he kind of just went away. And, no and he didn't actually like get beaten by the young guys. You're supposed to, the way it naturally works is the young guys start beating you, basically. They get better than you. Um, and it bothered me that the young guys maybe would never get the respect because they didn't beat those guys. They didn't knock them off the perch. Um, 
And I'm saying this because Alcaraz is the one guy that kind of has. So he won Madrid last year, and I think he beat Nadal and Djokovic in the mm-hmm. semis and finals in, in Madrid last year. Um, and I feel like I'm happy that he's the guy that sort of replaced those guys right now at number one in the world, because to me, he is a next level, the way he plays, the way he moves, the way he moves in between shots, the way his balance is. When If you could hit an overhead in the corner, he's running for it, and he's still going to be his body isn't going to be going like this. It's going, be, yeah. it's going to be perfectly straight, you know, when it shouldn't be able to be. So, um, so I, I guess I got to call him as the guy that, that uh, I think will win the, the title. I mean, obviously it'll be interesting to see if he plays Djokovic in the semis, what happens in, in that match, because Djokovic hasn't had a great spring, but you know, he's, he's the guy that's going to peak at the right time. So it'll be interesting that match. Um, Bottom half of the draw, I think, is sort of, you know, wide open in a lot of ways. There's any, anyone can get through that section. It was always, it's weird how tennis, Medvedev's one of the few guys now in these last five, eight, ten years that is a specialist in a way. I know he won Rome, and I know he had a better clay court season than he has had in the past. But his game just doesn't work on clay, really. Um, he can't break an egg from the back of the court. He just sort of serves well and gets free points on his serve and then makes every return and makes you hit 20 great shots to win a point, and eventually you fold. But on the clay, his serve isn't going to get him so many free points. He's going to have to win too many rallies, and it's just never going to be his surface, I don't think. Yeah. And he doesn't move as well on it. So that made that bottom half of the draw sort of, eh, anybody's. Yeah, so I think bottom half, my pick would be center. Yeah, he's he's been so close, but what happens to him? He gets tight or something. We'll see if he can finally make that through because he's been, to me, the second best player a bunch of times. He should have had match points on Alcaraz at the U.S. Open. Um, he's that guy that's like there. He's You were mentioning difference between quarters and winning. The, he's a quarters guy for sure, and then yes. he gets really close, and he's got all the tools. In yes. the end, he doesn't quite. He hasn't quite yet broken through. I think. He I, I do through. think. I don't think he's one weapon away, because I think his forehand's definitely a weapon. Yeah, he, you're I right. That, I think he's everything needs to get ten percent better, and yeah. I think if everything, you know, even if this summer, if they took like one aspect, maybe it's maybe it's the forehand, maybe it's the back. If they took one thing, maybe it's the serve. Actually, maybe it's the serve. I would see, I would give it the serve. And made it ten percent better between now and U.S. Open. I think yeah. that's the thing where you gotta you gotta have somewhere to go. You know what I mean? And I think in the and we get to the quarters and semis, Alcaraz has multiple places to go. Yes, he right? does. And I think you know, center does not. He's like the little brother to sort of that. So on this surface, you go TFO, you go center. I think that bottom half is a lot of opportunity for a lot of young guys. And the Bedford ever's out, so we'll see who sort of doesn't let Paris get to him. Yeah. Right? Doesn't spend too many nights at Miss Co. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking the fruity drinks and, and uh we'll see. But definitely top half, Djokovic and Alcaraz are a lock. Um I will say I want to before you leave, I will say IMG, right? I mean that is huge responsibility, huge opportunity, but also keeps I mean it really puts you on the front lines of the next generation. Who at the Academy do you think in four or five years we will be hearing about? Well, I mean, you right now there's Jerry Zhang, who's 160, 70, 80 in the world, and he's 17 years old. He's got obviously talent, great talent, but things have come a little bit too easy for him, and we'll see what happens when he starts getting his head beaten in a little bit more often on the tour level. So he, he got through the futures and the challengers pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, But now he's sort of, he's getting overpowered at times. He's, you know, there's things happening where he's losing for the first time and that's never that easy to deal with. He's always been near the top of the game in every age group, obviously. So we'll see how he handles that, but he has the talent. He should be a top 30 guy at some point in his in his career. There's another Martin Dom Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, 
six seven lefty can serve 140 miles an hour unfortunately for him he can't put it he can't place it quite the way he needs to he's like a foot away from being accurate enough to consistently get winning points it's amazing how well players return now so yes. he got to two or three in the world in the juniors because just by pace that was good enough right. but now you need pace and direction on, right. a, on the tour level and that's been eluding him to this point we'll see if 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 he can get there um so you know we'll we'll, we'll see i don't know that i yet there's a couple of 14 year olds coming for next year that i hear good things about and mm -hmm and I'll wait and see, but we're worldwide, not really just US. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got a couple of good Koreans coming and a couple of good Turkish players coming for mm. next year that are young. Mm. And we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. I think what I hear you saying when you talk about those two players is, in particular on the men's side, it is a man's game. There is a huge graduation from being 17 year old and the 17 year old's body and playing a grown man or serving a buck 45 straight in the middle of the box. And that other six footer is like, yeah, thanks. It's right here. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's sort of why I try to tell people that, you know, perhaps a girl who's 16 or 17, who probably is a fully developed woman physically can mm -hmm. graduate sooner to having a successful WTA career where there is a longer process from a 17 year old boy becoming a man. No and question. Unless you're, unless you're going to be that number one or two in the world. So Sinner got there pretty quickly, 18 or 19. Alcaraz has gotten there. Unless you're that incredible, like, exception. Right. You're not going to get there until you're 21, 22, 23, that kind of age group. And, you know, that's how, that's just how it works. Well, I want to thank you for your time. I hope the parents down at IMG are not giving you a hard time because you're top five in the world. You know. They do occasionally, <laughs> but that's all right. I can handle it. I understand <laughs> How many times have you had to look at parents and say, hey, I was top five in the world. I know what I'm talking about. Let me just do this. I, I, quite a few. My favorite one was uh, a kid, again, UTR. I'll just give you this quick story. <laughs> UTR match, kid's playing someone a little lower than him. He's losing 4-1. He falls down and says, my ankle, my ankle, my ankle. Um, Trainer comes out, we have trainers on the ground. The trainer comes out, looks at the ankle, tapes it up and says, you know what, it's, you can play. Um, and so he finishes the set, loses the set and then walks off the court and the mom, and by the way, the ankle was fine. Okay, so he, he wasn't injured. It turned out that the trainer was right. But the mom calls me, of course, to start screaming at me that how could I let him play, blah, 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 blah. I hurt his ankle. And I said, look, I played on the tour for 13 years, I can count, and your son tells me he wants to be a pro. Right. And I can count on my hand the number of times I felt 100% and there was no, nothing niggling injury, nothing that was bothering me. You have to play with whatever you have that day and try to win with whatever you have that day. So he's just practicing. I'm just having him practice for the future. When he has a little bit of a sprained ankle, he's got to figure out how to win that day. Not, not default. And she actually didn't yell at me anymore after that. So that <laughs> <laughs> and I told one other parent another time, I go, look, I don't know if you know this before you start going too crazy. I don't need this job All right. I can do it anytime I want. Um, I'm doing this because I want to help the kids, but go ahead. What you, you know, what you got? Throw, throw it at me. I got all right. <laughs> With that all, not needing a job always provides a level of credibility that helps you stand on your own. It, it did help. It did help. So, right. Well, I appreciate Thanks your time, you, Jimmy. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you. I always enjoy listening to your tennis channel. You definitely understand the game at a level, and those who are listening need to listen close because you know it at a level that most don't. So this well, has been the Tennis.com podcast with tennis legend, former top five in the world, tennis channel commentator, director of IMG Tennis, Jimmy Arias. Thanks, guys. Thanks. See you later.